Well, good afternoon, and welcome to Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. I'm Michael Trick, and I'm the dean here. Uh, today, we have what I think is going to be a really fascinating talk about field of research that lies at the intersection of social sciences and computing. Uh, pr Professor Agnieszka Wikowska works at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa, leading the unit on social cognition in human-robot interaction. She is also affiliated with Sweden's uh, Lulue University of Technology as an adjunct professor in engineering psychology. P professor Vikowska studied neuro neurocognitive psychology at Ludwig Maximilian University in München and philosophy at Jagiel uh, Jagiellonian University, Krakow. Uh, <laughs> Professor Bikowska's uh, research examines how humans respond to humanoid robots and how to make hu robots' behavior comprehensible for humans. This research is informing the development of artificial intelligence for social robotics and the design of robots for societal needs like healthcare, elder care, and care for those who require daily assistance. Before I invite our guest to the podium, I'd like to note that this, uh, today's talk is part of the Distinguished Lecture Series at CMUQ. Distinguished Lectures provide a glimpse into the depth and breadth of scholarship of the many experts who visit our campus. Today's presentation is a John Patrick Creason Distinguished Lecturer in Arts and Sciences, named in honor of the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Carnegie Mellon University from 1976 to 1983. After that, uh, Professor Creason became the provost before moving on and becoming president at uh, Georgia Tech. He liked Carnegie Mellon enough when he stepped down as president, he moved back to P Pittsburgh where he lived the rest of his life. Would everyone now please join me in welcoming Agnieszka uh, uh, Bikowska to Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. One you see here. This is a robot that um, is called iCub. It has been developed in our institute, the Italian Institute of Technology. So, uh, yes, as I mentioned, I'm interested in humans responding to robots in their kind of natural interaction. And um, when I say robots, you might think of something of that sort, right? You probably know that robot. Um, let me try to play that video. Oops, sorry. Doesn't, can I, sorry, click um, on the video? Okay, uh, well, you know those robots. Uh, there was supposed to be a video, but um, I'm pretty sure you've seen those very, very sophisticated um, humanoids in, in movies. And they are uh, extremely sophisticated in two ways. So first of all, behaviorally, they um, express sort of mental states like other humans. The, the Star Wars robots, they are worried, they have desires, they have thoughts of all sorts. And uh, then there are also very, like this one, um, this robot here um, from Ex Machina, she's extremely human-like in shape to the point that she's almost indistinguishable from a human. So this is perhaps the first association you might have when we, uh, when I say robots. Uh, and uh, that's because of popular culture that kind of feeds us with these, with these images. But um, in reality, we're not there yet. So this is all fantasy. And uh, now it goes. Um, but in reality, and I hope this one, <laughs> this one goes, in reality, this is where we are. So our robots are, um, behave in this way, and we're definitely not at the state of the art that we <laughs> think we are, given the, the um, popular culture that, that we go to, to see. So uh, there, as you see, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to bring the robots to the state that would be uh, desired for human-robot interaction. 
So we're aiming here, and uh, we would like to have robots assist us in our daily lives in healthcare, elderly care, perhaps childcare. And, um, and as I said, we're very, very far away from that aim, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done from various disciplines. So what do we need to do? On the robotics side, there's a massive effort that needs to be done, and here I listed only three uh, areas that are kind of related to human-robot interaction. Um, and, but there's, of course, much, much more that needs to be done on the robotics side. But I will not talk about robotics, because my background is not robotics. Um, my background is uh, cognitive neuroscience, and from there, uh, we also need to do a lot. So I'll be talking about that part of, of the work that needs to be done, and that is sort of uh, what I address in my work is the mechanism, the, the cognitive mechanisms that we need to address in human-robot interaction to make robots understandable for humans and humans understandable for robots so that the interaction is smooth and very intuitive in such a way like we have an interaction with another human. Um, so how to address this? Uh, how to address the, the issue of... Um, sort of humans reacting to robots, understanding how the brain, the human brain processes signals from that the robots deliver and vice versa. Uh, in my work and in, in our lab, we address these questions with cognitive neuroscience methods in um, kind of interactive setups. So what we do is we take um, not only um, like EEG and, and eye tracking. Here you see she's wearing um, a mobile eye tracker. These are, these are cognitive neuroscience methods that help us understand, as I say, brain mechanisms in interaction. So we take that, but not only that, we also borrow from cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience the experimental design and how experiments are built in order to address very specific mechanisms of human cognition. And then we translate those kind of more classical designs into more interactive protocols where you see the, the, the human and the robot are doing something together, are engaged in a joint task. And that is very different from more classical psychological research where you sit, typically you sit your um, participants in front of a computer screen, they see like just 2D images and measure their reactions towards those. Here we let our participants act and interact with the robot, and it's a very challenging task to do that. So I'll be talking you through um, this, this kind of challenges that we face. All right, um, I'll be talking a lot uh, during my talk about um, social attunement. Uh, so I wanted to um, tell you what I mean by that concept so that we're on the same page. Social attunement is a very, <clears throat> an umbrella concept that I use for an, um, kind of um, all sorts of mechanisms of social cognition that we use on a daily basis with one another. Very often they are implicit, very automatic mechanisms that we don't re even realize. So one of those mechanisms, and I'll be talking about it in length, is joint attention. It's a situation that I point there and your attention goes there, right? You Automatic, the case of, for example, individuals diagnosed with autism, they don't engage in joint attention that easily, then all other mechanisms of social cognition don't work. Because we need to understand where the focus of attention of our interaction partner is. So these sort of mechanisms, that's what I address in, in my work. And here in this little uh, video, you'll see a demonstration of a subset of such cognitive mechanisms that I'll be talking about later on. Um, so, first of all, mutual gaze, uh, very important in social interactions. Then gestures to communicate intentions, right? Then um, communicating that I understood the intentions of the robot, right? And I confirm again with mutual gaze. Then there's some level of joint action, interaction. Um, here we're doing something together. This is very, very basic joint action, but yet still it is. And then something like emotional synchronization, we succeeded in this task together, we're happy, and, and that is something that definitely happens on a daily basis with other humans, and we would like to see under what conditions can we evoke the similar mechanisms in an interaction with a humanoid robot. Yeah? Okay, so research questions that I'll... <clears throat> 
kind of go through that we address in our lab um, are the following. First of all, one of the very, um, the key research question that I address in, in, in my project is how much the social attunement, so what I just explained to you, these mechanisms of social cognition, how do they depend on adopting the intentional stance towards a robot? This sounds very, very technical, but I'll guide you through this concept and it's very actually easy and intuitive as you'll see. So intentional stance, um, what is that? Uh, intentional stance go, uh, dates back to a philosopher, Daniel Dennett, who introduced this concept as a, uh, to, to denote a situation where we explain and predict behaviors of others with reference to their mental states. So our brain needs to be able to predict and explain behavior of all sorts of systems around us all the time, right? You see things happening in the environment and your brain needs to understand what's going on and perhaps be even ahead of time in predicting what's going to be happening next. Um, so we do that to, towards all systems, but human system, so the human, is a very specific one because we understand and explain behavior of humans with reference to mental states. When you see me grasping a glass of water, you will probably predict that, or explain my behavior by saying, oh, she wants to drink from that glass. Want is a mental state. She believes that water will ease her thirst. Belief is a mental state, right? So explaining and predicting behavior with reference to mental states is the intentional stance, okay? I take an intentional stance towards someone when I predict and explain their behavior with reference to mental states. On the other side, you have something that is called design stance. And that is with respect to um, artifacts, cars. If you push a brake pedal of your car, it will stop and you will not be explaining that behavior by saying, oh, the car wanted or desired to stop, right? You understand that the car stopped because that was, it was designed this way, to stop when I push the brake pedal. Now, perhaps you already see that humanoid robots are an interesting case that might fall in between those two categories, right? Because they look like humans, they behave like humans, so you might have a natural tendency to attribute mental states to them, to say like, oh, the robot is sad and it doesn't want to do something, or um, it looks very shy to me, it's perhaps um, not willing to cooperate. These are all mental states, and people actually do that quite a lot. On the other hand, these are artifacts, so um, you would think that as an artifact, people should adopt design stance towards them. And that's the key question for me is, when do people adopt one or the other stance towards humanoid robots? <clears throat> and what sort of effect does it have for social attunement? So do we adopt intentional stance? And uh, I'll probably in this talk, I'll give you more questions than actually answers because this is all work in progress and, and it's very, very, all these questions are extremely complex and it's not that we can have answers very quickly. But there are many interesting hints that we see in our, in our work. So do we int adopt intentional stance towards robots? Um, what, um, um, the, the, the approach that we take in addressing this question is the following. We are very much interested in how much behavior of a robot plays a role in adopting the intentional stance. So we work with that, that ICAP robot. It already has quite a humanoid shape and we're not so much interested in appearance of the robot. What we're interested in is whether it behaves in a human way. If it behaves in a human way, whether people would then be more likely to treat it like as if it had mental states and would adopt intentional stance towards it. So in order to make the robot behave like a human, we first need to understand how does a human actually behave. So we measure human behavior at a very, very subtle level, subtle behavioral cues, and then uh, with, for example, eye tracking methods and head trackers, and then we copy those behaviors on the robot and we see whether people would adopt intentional stance. So here, just to give you an example of this kind of behavior, here uh, you'll see our participants of our experiment. She is um, engaged in a task here. It's not very important what sort of task it is. But while she's doing this task, we're measuring her eye movements and the head movement. It's an inertial sensor here. In the periphery, um, 
there, somewhere in the lab, um, there is a um, computer screen. Uh, what, uh, what we do is we play um, like um, a loop of movies, and every now and then there would be a very loud sound. And she would react to that sound, uh, because it's loud and it's, it's kind of salient, so she would react to it. Now, what is important is that, as a human, eyes, there are little saccades, because she's engaged in the task. <laughs> now the loud sound happened, and she uh, turned her head. Right? And um, we've measured all the parameters of that behavior. And then the next step is copy that on the robot. And I would like you, because to me, when I saw that, we actually took the data, copied it on the robot, which was not an easy task. This was our engineers working on that to translate the human um, coordinates into um, controllers on the robot. Uh, once you have that, when I saw this, it made such an impression on me uh, of human likeness. And let's hope I can play that. Yes, so you please focus on the eyes, and um, if you see the, the movement of the eyes is very human-like, and the robot reacts to the, to, the, to, the, to the video, which is also very human-like, right? So why should robot react to a laughter of a human there? Um, so this is the type of, of work we're doing, and we're trying to understand how uh, much this will make uh, humans adopt intentional stance or not. Now, how do we actually measure whether people adopted the intentional stance or not. This is something we have done with a type of a questionnaire-like um, approach. So we have des um, designed these um, series of items um, in which each item is um, uh, three photos. And you see there's a story developing here. So something is happening in these three photos. And um, underneath the photos, our participants have um, descriptions of what is happening there. And one of the descriptions is um, mentalistic, so with reference to mental states. ICAB is trying to cheat. Cheating is a mental state, right? Um, and another one is very mechanistic. ICAP is unbalanced. Right? And what we do is we look into uh, participants, we ask participants to move the slider, this slider, towards the explanation that they think fits best to what's happening here in the scenario. Right? So we see whether participants are ac actually more inclined towards the mentalistic explanations or mechanistic. In this way, we try to understand whether they've adopted intentional stance towards the robot or not. And in these two examples, these were actually the highest mentalistic examples of our questionnaire. Uh, if you recode this in such a way that zero would mean mechanistic and 100 would mean mentalistic, um, so anything above 50 is mentalistic, you see that they scored very high on the mentalistic um, um, part. So uh, people, yes, they are actually in some context inclined to describe robot behavior in mentalistic terms. It all depends on the context. There's a lot of inter-individual variability, so some people are more likely to adopt intentional stance, some are less. But just to give you a flavor of how we're probing these questions, this is what we're doing. Um, another interesting um, sort of study that we've done is while participants were asked to, to make these decisions about mentalistic and mechanistic explanations of the robot behavior, we were measuring their EEG. And we would like to see whether from EEG you can predict what sort of stance people have towards the robots. So maybe in the future we won't even need to ask our participants, but we can measure from EEG whether they sort of approach a robot in a more intentional way, or rather treat it just in a as an artifact. Um, okay, so that was part about intentional stance. Now I'll guide you through other mechanisms that are um, perhaps more intuitive um, because they, they are really things that we, we uh, observe in our social interactions on a daily basis. Things like mutual gaze. Mutual gaze is very, very important for social interactions. As you know, we establish contact, like um, we, sh we communicate the willingness to be um, engaged in interac interaction through mutual gaze. 
But it's very tricky because there is a certain amount of neutral gaze that is fine, and then a certain amount that is maybe too long or too short. All these parameters are things that we know like automatically, we've learned how to employ them. But in order for robots to have them, we need to understand how much of mutual gaze is okay, how much is too much. And all that stuff um, is our, um, our research. So um, just to cut the long story short, we were interested in how much mutual gaze affects joint attention and how much of that mutual gaze do we want to have. And joint attention is again, as I explained earlier, is the situation that I direct my uh, head or my pointing there, and you attend there as well. So we engage together in, mutual, in um, joint attention towards an event in the environment. Does mutual gaze before that gesture help? And that's what we examined here in this experiment. I will not go into details because they're very technical, but basically uh, what we manipulated is the robot gazing at our participant or not, and then engaging our participant in, in joint attention. And this is how it looks in the lab. Um, so the robot first looks in the eyes. It has an algorithm, by the way, to detect where the eyes are, and then engages in, like, directs attention to one of the sides. Um, and, and here again, but it then um, directs to, to another side. I, as I say, I won't go into details. But here I want to show you the no eye contact when it looks down, right? and then uh, continues with the joint attention uh, part. And the interesting for us question is how much this mutual gaze condition affects joint attention. So in our data, what we see, and again, um, I will not um, guide you, I will, I will not go into details, but just wanted to tell you that um, the larger the difference between the two bars, and I will be very happy to explain you the details if you're interested later on, uh, but the larger the difference, the more engagement and joint attention there is. So what we have shown is that in the eye contact condition, people engage in joint attention more with the robot. And that's quite um, striking because, I mean, these are just cameras, right? Why would you have a social effect with two cameras? Yet, when the robot looks at you, and actually it really does search for your eyes, so you feel that it, it does engage you in gaze contact, that's a very strong effect. Um, like, socially, you feel, even though I work with that robot every day, when it looks at me, it makes it makes a difference. So that's quite striking that two set like a camera, two two cameras can uh, with that are mechanical kind of eyes can make a difference. <clears throat> All right, and another uh, measure that we took in this experiment is actually we asked participants subjectively to tell us uh, how much engaged they felt with the robot, and they felt much more engaged, and that's the bar here, much more engaged when the robot engaged them in, in eye contact. So we have two measures. One is a more objective one, a kind of implicit measure of joint attention, and another one that is explicit, subjective measure, and they both tell us, yes, mutual gaze with the robot works and is actually quite important. Um, so, uh, with this experiment, it was actually a series of experiments, we have shown that mutual gaze affects low-level mechanisms of social cognition and engagement. Another very um, important aspect in social interactions is um, gaze contingency. So, it's the situation now, in the previous experiment, the, the robot was guiding our participants' attention to one of the sides. In this experiment, what we've done is that participant is actually guiding the robot. So what we uh, do is we ask our participants to wear an eye tracker, and we send a signal from that eye tracker to the robot, and the robot uh, follows participants' gaze or not. And that's, again, a very strong effect subjectively. It feels super strange because I look somewhere, and then the robot is following where I look, uh, which is something we do between humans, but when a robot does that, that is, it makes a very, very strong impression. So this is how it looks. She's here um, sitting in front of the, uh, of the iCub, and she is, her task is to just choose one of the screens, one of the objects freely. She can look around wherever she wants, and then the robot either follows her in one condition or not. So we sort of make this manipulation that there is one identity of the robot called Jimmy, and Jimmy follows her in 80% of trials. And then there's Dylan. Dylan follows her only in 20% of trials. And what we want to see is how much this will affect her engagement and joint attention. So um, 
right now you see it from, from her perspective, but in a moment you'll see it from the robot's perspective. You see that she's uh, moving her eyes, selecting one of the locations, and while she's doing that, we're measuring her, um, her eye movements. And here you see, this is the eye movements from the eye tracker. In this case, robot followed her gaze to the same location. And now you'll see another one. So she moved here, and the robot has, um, followed her um, again. Um, so what we want to see is how fast would she return with saccades back to the robot, meaning how much she would, how uh, easily would she re-engage with the robot. And that's our dependent variable. So what we have observed is that humans are very sensitive to this kind of behavior, and they're actually much faster, and this is what you see here, much faster to return back to the robot, to the robot face when it follows them in the kind of Jimmy condition, so in the one that is in general following. In the other one, in the disjoint um, condition, it's reverse. Very interesting, showing us if you want to engage people with robots, you need to have this kind of contingency, which is a very challenging task from the robotics perspective, because right now we're using the eye tracker optimally. In the future, we would like to be able to do that from the robot cameras to be able to detect where people are looking and then follow their eyes. Um, uh, accordingly. Um, another, another, um, another measure that we took is again like complementing subjective, um, as objective measures with subjective measures. So we, we administered um, a questionnaire that um, measures anthropomorphism and likability. And in this particular experiment, we have observed that people liked also the robot that followed them uh, more. We didn't see any effects on anthropomorphism here, and that's probably because the robot looked the same. It was the same robot, so the, it was not enough um, to, to, to make a difference in the, in the questionnaire. Okay, so contingent behavior of the robot plays a role in engagement and, um, and liking of the robot. And in another experiment that I didn't show you, um, here are the data also on anthropomorphizing. Um, good. Another aspect of um, joint attention is um, action expectations, and it's a very, very natural, again, very fundamental mechanism uh, that we use, and it's the following. When I look at the glass, you probably, your brain already predicts that I'll be manipulating that glass, right? Because we look at things first before we man manipulate them. Um, quite um, trivial uh, effect, but interestingly, this allows your brain to be a little bit of ahead of time and predict what can be my next action step. So you monitor my gaze because it gives you an advantage of understanding what might happen next. And this is something we looked into also in our experiments where we looked in um, joint attention in a kind of action context. And we looked at how the robot um, confirms or so confirms or um, goes against expectations of humans with respect to their actions. So this is just to show you the interactive scenario. Um, maybe. Yeah, no, back. So the robot is um, here. Um, so sort of the humans are primed uh, that the robot will do a certain action, grasp one of the bottles because it's in a certain action context, and then pass it on to the to the subject. But then the robot gazes either at the one that it was uh, it will then manipulate or not. So it confirms or violates expectations. And very interestingly, what we see is in our measures, so she's also measuring, uh, she's also wearing an eye tracker here, but additionally she's doing um, an additional task through which we look at those um, kind of objective measures of joint attention. And what you see is that um, a joint attention is reduced when there is a violation of expectations. So again, we employ very human-like mechanisms in interaction with, with uh, robots. And, of, of social cognition. So we employ exactly the same mechanisms as we would employ with another human to a humanoid robot. Um, so action expectations also influence joint attention. This is something we know from human-human interaction, but interestingly, we observe similar mechanism with a robot. 
Good. Um, now I'll go into a little bit higher level social cognition. So this was our very low level fundamental mechanisms. And now I'll talk about something that is higher level. And I think this is some of these things are quite fascinating because I didn't expect them to, to go this way. Um, so uh, I'll talk about diffusion of responsibility. What is that? Uh, it's a situation that you, I'm pretty sure you know uh, that you know, something happens on the street, someone faints and nobody acts. There's a group of people, but nobody acts. Why does that happen? Because there's diffusion of responsibility in groups. So when we are together, it's like everybody's responsibility to act, but actually nobody does anything. Uh, unfortunately, that is something we know from social psychology that this happens. And um, social psychologists have shown that uh, related to this, uh, effect. Um, there's something that is called reduced sense of agency. So when we act in a group um, of other people, we feel less in control because there are others around. So I feel less in control of my own actions. And this has been shown with other humans. Now, do we also show the same effect with a robot? Um, so this experiment will not be with iCub. It will be with a very small Cosmo robot that is super cute and it's very, very expressive and very social. I don't know, maybe some of them, uh, some of you know the robot. It's, um, it's commercially available, quite a cheap one, but you can do super cool experiments with it too. And we asked exactly that question. Do we see a reduced sense of agency when interacting with a little not even a humanoid, a little Cosmo robot. Um, so let me guide you through this experimental paradigm because I think it's quite fascinating. It's, um, you have two conditions, either you play alone or you play with Cosmo. And uh, what you need to do is you need to stop a balloon from popping. So on the screen, you see a balloon that grows larger and larger. At some point, it hits the pin here and then it pops. Okay, so you have to prevent it from popping. But the trick is, is the longer you wait, uh, the higher the gain. Okay, so if you, um, if you stop the balloon here, you lose a number of points. Th th these are points that you lose always, okay? You lose a number of points and it's quite actually a large number because you stopped too early, okay? If you stop here, you lose only nine points, all right? So you kind of have to take a risk but watch out, because you shouldn't be too, go too far with it, because if it pops, you lose maximum amount of points, all right? So you need to be careful, take a little bit of a risk, but not too much, okay? And that's your, uh, when you do it alone. Now you can also do it with um, the Cosmo robot, everything goes similarly, but also Cosmo can act sometimes, and that's actually best. If Cosmo acts, you don't lose any points. But Cosmo doesn't act always, right? It acts sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't. And you don't know whether it will act or not. So you have to take a risk, but you're playing a game together. And that's exactly the situation. So we operationalized in the lab a situation of shared responsibility. Now we're both responsible for this balloon not to pop. And then what we measure is participants' subjective um, experience of control. How much, we ask them, how much in control did you feel over the outcome in the individual condition or in the joint condition with Cosmo? So um, this is how it looks, um, maybe if you could Play it. No. Maybe I will. Ah, there you go. Okay. So uh, we need to tap on those little cubes to make the, uh, the balloon stop from inflating. You see Cosmo woke up. As <laughs> you see, it's a very small one, and it's, but it's super cute. And then it's ready to act uh, right now. Uh, we're playing this together, you see the balloon inflating, goes larger and larger, and, and the robot pressed. So thank God uh, Cosmo saved our points here. And the next thing is you evaluate how much in control did you feel of, of, the, um, of the outcome. Um, all right, so our data show that actually Interestingly, you see a reduced sense of agency in the joint condition with the robot, exactly in a similar way as with another human. Interestingly, though, if you run this experiment with a computer program, so not an embodied robot, but you're playing against the computer, you don't see the effect. 
So embodiment matters. When you play, even though it's a tiny embodiment in this case, it does matter a lot. And, um, and that's again quite striking. So we kind of treat them really like social entities. And it has um, also the unfortunate consequences that if robots are going to be one day around us in our environment, we might um, have this reduced sense of agency and also um, kind of shared responsibility where nobody acts because everybody expects the other party to act, right? So that has profound consequences for the future and robots around us in the future. Okay, so similarly, like with other humans, we also show this um, reduced sense of agency with robots. Um, good, another experiment that we looked into was like how much do we adapt our own behavior to a robot behavior. So in this experiment, the, ro the human is teaching a sequence to the robot. The robot is learning, sort of, it's pre-programmed in our experiment, but it pretends to be learning, and it's getting better and better. And we see in whether um, uh, participants um, adopt a similar strategy as you would adopt towards a kid when you slow down for, towards a kid or any other pupil. The pupil is not so um, skilled yet in a task, so you slow down. And we wanted to see if that happens also with a robot. Um, it's funny how some of them work from there and some from here. No, back, if you go back. Maybe now, let me press. Yes. Okay, so the human comes up with a, could you? Um, and now the robot is still so skilled, you see. And then in the third uh, session, this is very strange. <laughs> In the third session, it will move faster, and the delay between the robot and the human will be much smaller. And you will see it now. So now it acquired the skill, right? And what is interesting for us is how much people actually slow down in the slow phase. And indeed, they do. So what you see here is that the period with which people are tapping, so that's the, the average time between two taps, is slower in the um, longer delay condition. So they do adapt to a robot as if they would adapt to another person that they would be teaching a skill. Again, treating the robot in a very social way. Um, so, yes, humans can adapt to robots when, it, when they're placed in this kind of role of a teacher follower. And then another interesting aspect is also social cognition is can we actually lie to a robot? I, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't necessarily have a problem lying to a coffee machine. Why would you even lie to a coffee machine? But if you were to lie, you wouldn't have a problem with it because it's an artifact, right? But you do have a problem lying to another human. And the question is, would you have a problem to lie towards a, a humanoid robot? And this question we addressed with um, Paradigm there that participants were um, engaged in a kind of Skype conversation with the robot. Again, the robot had to learn, um, you don't see them very well here, but it was again learning a sequence. And um, participants were asked to give feedback to the robot, whether it's um, tapped on the correct sequence or not, and then they knew what the correct sequence was, and they were asked to sometimes give incorrect feedback. And they were actually incentivized in such a way that if they get, give incorrect feedback but are not caught, then uh, they gain a lot of points. So you, again, you need to take a little bit of risk, maybe sometimes lie to the robot, um, because, but watch out, don't be caught, right? Now, the interesting manipulation was that the robot engaged in mutual gaze again. After each feedback, it looked at the participant. Yeah? And after the correct feedback, great. After the one that you lie, it looks you in the eyes and is kind of checking. Right? And now the question is, would you lie again to the robot if it did that to you? And if you have a problem, that means that that gaze is a social gaze again, because we're again talking just about the machine and cameras, right? So um, this is how it looks. It says hi to you, and then it has to pick the, um, the right sequence. And while participants are engaged in this task, they are, we're measuring also their galvanic skin response, but I won't talk about this, um, uh, these measures now. Just 
behaviorally, what we observe here is, this is the interesting part here, is that when the robot looked at you after you lied to it, you're going to be much more likely to give correct feedback, so to give to to be truthful towards the robot in the next trial, yeah? So you do have a problem with lying to it when it looks at you. And uh, that's quite interesting, as I say, because that means that you really process this gaze as a social gaze and not as like just two cameras there. Okay, so uh, yes, humans have a hard time lying to a robot, especially when it establishes mutual gaze. Um, Good, so what are the applications of, of, the, of all this work? Um, as I mentioned many times now, these are all very fundamental mechanisms of social cognition and they're very important when we want to have a natural, intuitive interaction with robots. So um, our work uh, has um, implications for robotics and improved HRI because we can tell our roboticists, look, this is how the robot needs to behave. It needs to engage in mutual gaze for this amount of seconds. It needs to um, engage in contingent um, actions and reactions. It perhaps needs to have this um, kind of human-like eye movements and so on and so forth. So that's kind of clear that we can provide guidelines to robotics how it should uh, behave. But it's also very, very useful for more applied domains where robots are there to assist us in education, in clinical settings, and particularly here, the interesting and very important part is um, children diagnosed with autism, because robots have been shown that they work very well with autism and training social skills for children diagnosed with autism. Kids with autism open up to robots, they're very happy to interact with them, and then we can kind of leverage on this and use robots to train um, social skills. And we've actually done in the past uh, some work, and we're now going again into this direction of working with, um, with institutions, with children that are diagnosed with autism. And um, the first work that we've done was with a different type of robot because that was in the past. And uh, this is a robot that has been developed in Singapore. Uh, kind of looks like a teddy bear, but it's, it's a robot. And we train joint attention. Uh, I mentioned earlier that people with um, autism, they have problems in engaging in joint attention. Um, but in our, in our training, Kids um, are trained uh, in kind of a game-like way with the robot, so they have to respond to the color of a little um, picture that is here presented on one of the screens, so, and the robot guides their attention to one of the screens, and uh, they can do this task only if they actually follow um, the, the head and the gaze of the robot. And they like playing it a lot, and uh, they play for several weeks, and what we show is that uh, they improve in joint attention skills towards another human. So that is very important. They actually transfer the skills that they learned with the robot to a human interaction partner. And that's extremely promising. And we're right now launching a whole program back in, um, in Genoa in, in Italy uh, with um, institutions uh, for healthcare where we are going to train these joint attention mechanisms, but also other social cognition mechanisms with our robots. So I think it's a very promising avenue, and that's where we can help society by building those social robots. But in order for them to function properly, we first need to understand how should they behave and how to implement those social skills on them. All right, so to conclude generally, um, our embodied robots allow us to understand um, social cognition at the fundamental level, so fundamental research, and uh, understand those mechanisms better when humans interact with these kind of embodied agents, but um, still artificial agents. Um, what I have shown you in these little uh, snapshots of, of, of the work that we're doing is that uh, things like neutral gaze, gaze contingency, intentional stance, they all have an impact on um, social attunement with, with um, robots. Um, and that they can be treated as social entities, as you have seen in this lying paradigm or in the diffusion of responsibility, they actually are treated quite as social entities. And because they can be treated as social entities, they can be used in applications to healthcare because they're not just simple automata. They are something that can help us in training social skills, for example. So I would like to thank to the European Research Council for um, supporting this research, uh, to my team back in Genoa, extremely motivated and, and very um, passionate young people, and um, 
thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have time uh, for some questions. It's not working. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the, the insightful presentation. So uh, I'm, I'm a little bit curious to know about like the data you use to train your uh, robot and if you have a common sense knowledge of, uh, you, know, you know, this artificial intelligence problem of the world uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so of the, the AI behind the robot, that's not yes. my work. That's oh. my colleague's work. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm more interested in the human side of the human-robot interaction. And the data that, uh, that our um, roboticists use are, um, well, ImageNet data, for example, for, for image and, and um, recognition and anything that is available uh, for um, speech, for example, they use also, they work with, with IBM and, and use Watson. Uh, so there's a lot of work, in, and actually it's a very sophisticated platform from the AI perspective. We also you have our own databases, so the robot is being trained on object, for object recognition on objects within our lab, and it's a huge database that we have now developed. By the way, this is an open platform robot, so uh, you can access all the software and also the databases and everything online from, from our institute. Thank you. Uh, a fantastic presentation, obviously. I notice uh, in one of the uh, shots, uh, your robot has uh, not only handed over the thing, but the articulation of the movement was from the waist, actually, mm -hmm. something like that. Right. So is it deliberate? Because humans associate robotics with uh, non-human things, like robotic movements, mm -hmm. dances, and all those things, like you know, breaking movements. <laughs> But we see uh, some kind of an articulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, you have put in some effort to do that articulation to make it more humanoid. Is that right. in the yes. background, or is yes. it just simply technical? No, no. Like it articulation, is, yeah. No, no. Yeah. It is definitely bio inspired. The whole, all the controllers in the, in the robot are uh, made in such a way that uh, they're bio inspired. So, also the gaze and the head movement and the, the way um, the, the gaze. Um, is happening with respect to the head movement. It's also based on human data. And this is partially based on literature and partially actually on, on our research and also our, of our colleagues in the, in the institute. Yeah, because whatever it is, in the future, if for a normal human being, like, you know, to accept robots, to be more close to the whole wholesome, like the, art, the whole articulated movements with emotions and everything, not really that. So they want, maybe in Italy you can try to dress them up, put them on the Milan catwalk, <laughs> how they work. Thank you. Right, yes, thank you. So it, when it comes to the human subjects, uh, how, how often have this, they seen this robot before they did the experiment? They sit down and that's the first time they've interacted mm. with it, or does their behavior change if they've been working with it for a week or two? Right. Very good question. Thank you. Um, yes, it's a, it's a huge issue that actually needs to be factored in in our designs, and we have to be very careful um, that if we are aiming at people who have kind of more naive um, attitude that they ha shouldn't have interacted with our robot, which is getting more and more difficult because our subject pool is kind of getting exploited. So soon they will all have, but luckily we have students every every new semester, there are new students, so we try that. But um, experience and expertise with robots definitely has a plays a major role, and especially in the intentional stance part, I don't think roboticists would ever adopt intentional stance towards a but they would always treat it as an artifact because they know exactly the inner workings of it. So, um, yes, uh, this is actually one of my work packages in my project is to look into, into experience and expertise as, um, as a factor in, in the kind of social attunement and intentional stance. Okay, time for one final question. I'll let you pick. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were first slightly <laughs> earlier. Right. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, so uh, I imagine that social attunement is very culturally driven. So the amount of gaze, the body language, the uh, movement are you know, uh, different in each culture. 
Do you accommodate for that? Have you started yes. working on this? It's, it's a, a fantastic question and uh, yes, I completely agree that um, that it's uh, cultural and what we're doing is we have one work package where we're working with Singapore and we're going to look into these things in Singapore, Italy and even within Europe there are differences between Germany and Italy and so we are looking into these things. I was just discussing earlier, we were discussing that it would be very interesting to also look into intercultural differences between here and Italy uh, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot to be done and if robots are to be um, among us, then we need to accommodate for these things and we need to tailor them to a culture that they're embedded in, so definitely. Okay, one final topic, uh, <laughs> question for Valentin. Uh, the question is, uh, what about the sound? Because is there any integration between Siri? Because <laughs> we kind of already talked to robots. I mean, the, the, like, is there any, because, uh, Yes, it has it has an um, algorithm, and and we're working also on on uh, natural language processing for for the for the robot. But again, this is not my work. This is the the AI people in our in our institute working on that. I deliberately don't. Um, use language and, and verbal communication yet because there is so much to be done on the nonverbal level first. Not to introduce additional confounds and complexity. Language and verbal communication is so extremely complex and there are so many things happening that before we get there we need to first understand the nonverbal part and then the next step would be would be to go in that direction, yes. Okay. I'm going, oh, okay, I, you're going to have kittens at the back, okay, it's please. It's not a question, it's just that the library has a Cosmo robot, and anyone in the museum, you can borrow it if they want to work with it or program it. I highly recommend because it's a very cute one, so please go ahead and try out. But you, but you have to treat it right. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Tell us weird things, so. okay let us thank Dr. Capacity. Thank you very much.